with those that are able, uh, kneel with me in prayer. Lord and Heavenly Father, it is with great gladness we come to your house today to worship you. Lord, as we look back on all that you have done for us and have promised, we are so blessed and we are so lucky to be here. Lord, but there are things happening around this world that are, cause us concern, that worry, that upset. And Lord, we just pray for your continued presence. And we also ask, Lord, that as we do go through the trials of this life, that we remember you and what you have promised. Your word is sure, our salvation is sure, and help us never to forget that. Lord, we just ask today that uh, in a very special way you will be with the McDonald family as they feel the loss Lord um, we ask for your comfort this morning too Lord we ask that you will be with Mike as he brings your word to us and we pray that uh, we will go away refreshed we will go away with that little bit more hope in our hearts from having heard today what Mike has for us Lord, just pray that for those who are unable to be here with us today. May you look after them. May you comfort them. May you give them travelling mercies. Wherever they are, Lord, please be with them. Lord, we just uh, ask that as we go into this, the rest of this week, that we will remember what you have done for us. And Lord, we just thank you that you do forgive us for our sin. Lord, also help us when we do remember that, that we will rest in you, rest on your strength, and that the temptations of this world that the devil sets for us will become ever less. So, Lord, guide us and bless us all. In the words of this song that we've just sang, give us Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Let me say that it is a privilege for Hannah, my wife, my family and myself to be invited here to Whangarei. And for those who do not know, we fellowship at Dargabal, have done for about 20 years now, and frankly I'm quite surprised how time has flown over that period of time. It's been a real blessing so far this morning. I just want to mention this before we continue, that even though we never participated to a great degree outside of listening in our Sabbath school lesson, I just couldn't help thinking that uh, God's people are very much aware of the times that we live in, of truths that are found in Scripture. That's why we come together, isn't it? That we can share one another's thoughts. What you think is sometimes different to what I think. But we come together. We're on this same journey. We come to encourage one another on this walk. Why do you think it's like that? Well, there's a great battle going on. And your eternal destiny is at stake. And of course, that came out here in our uh, Sabbath school this morning. God has given us the freedom of choice. And so as we choose what path we're going to participate, the narrow path, that path will lead to God's eternal kingdom or the wide path. And so before we start, our study is about the rich man and Lazarus. Before we start, I'd like to just bow for another word of prayer. Father in heaven, it is such a privilege of being able to stand where I stand here this morning. But it's not about me, Father. I desire to be an instrument in the hand of the Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit be our teacher here this morning. That each one of us here may be fed according to your will. 
And this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, so you're aware of our study today and uh, of our scripture reading found in Luke. But I want to study, uh, I mean, start with a reading from Christ's Object Lessons about this parable. And it says this, it says, In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus shows that in this life, men decide their eternal destiny. During probationary time, the grace of God is offered to every soul. What do you understand probationary time to be? Anyone got an idea? Now? Probationary time for humanity then. You see, that's absolutely right. But probationary time for humanity really is the duration of life or the duration of your life. And so it says, during probationary time, the grace of God is offered to every soul. But if men waste their opportunities in pleasing themselves, they cut themselves off from everlasting life. No after probation will be granted them. By their own choice, they have fixed an impassable gulf between them and their God. Brethren, once again we shall say God has granted to all the freedom to choose, the freedom of choice. And so I just want to ask you this question as we start, what is a parable? A story? Okay, we'll go down that path. A short story. A parable is a short story, but it is designed to convey with it a truth, a moral lesson, a truth. That's what a parable is. Now, Jesus recognized the value of parable teaching to the people of his day. And he desired to stimulate their deepest thoughts. And if he spoke too literally, certain groups of his hearers would have attempted to quickly forget those words. Other groups of which there would have been stern rebuke, would have attempted to silence Jesus by violence. But Jesus recalled these words. They're found in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9, but Jesus spoke them in Luke chapter 8. Turn with me, if you will, Luke chapter 8. He was recording the words that are found in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 9. But Luke chapter 8, and we shall read... Verse 9 and 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Jesus often spoke in parables to veil the truth. To veil the truth from those who simply were not interested in seeing it. For those who had a desire to know, they would not stop until they found the truth. That's why the Bible says, Seek and ye shall find. It takes effort, brethren. You do not leave the Bible on the table to gather cobwebs. We need to seek after the truth. For within Scripture, there is eternal life. So, who was Jesus speaking this parable to? What category of people was he speaking this to? In Luke chapter 16, verse 14, we read, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees, a class of men who were widely known for their refusal to deal honestly with Jesus and the truths that Jesus taught. Of all the people Jesus taught, none were handled more guardedly than the Pharisees were. 
Because they dealt with deception, but Jesus dealt with them wisely and he dealt with them truthfully. The safest way to do this was by parable. And evidence that they did not understand much of his teachings can be found in Jesus' prayer in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and I'm going to read verse 21. In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good unto, unto thy sight. And so with this as a, a sort of an introduction to this parable, we want to now get into this parable, let us see what Jesus, the message that Jesus was trying to convey in this message. And so we turn to Luke chapter 16, and we're going to start reading from verse 19. And I shall read firstly the first three verses. And it says this, and there uh, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. So brethren... Who was the rich man? Who did the rich man symbolize here? Who was the symbolic rich man here? Because the Jews had been blessed above measure by a knowledge of God and a knowledge of the plan of salvation for Humanity. That made them rich. And I want to ask you this question. How rich are you? Do you know God? Are you aware of the plan of salvation that God has presented to mankind for the world? Because, brethren, that's exactly what makes you rich. It's not the material world. If you know God, you have everything. You possess the heritage that God promises and God opens to the redeemed all that he has created. That makes you rich. I want to read from Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 and verse 4 reads like this. <clears throat> Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? And now back to Christ's object lessons 262. The Lord's blessings rested upon him, the Jew, abundantly. But he employed them selfishly to honor himself and not his maker. So clearly you and I can clearly see, can't we, that what makes us rich, we are to share with the world. We are to share them that our maker, our creator is honoured and not ourselves. In proportion to his abundance was his obligation to use his gifts for the uplifting of humanity. Now only a Jew would pray to Father Abraham as we find this rich man doing later in the story. 
the Jewish nation was clearly represented by this character. And so, brethren, I'll ask you this question too. Are you a Jew? Are you a Jew? Spiritual Israel. You see, this message here, you need to learn and take it to your life. We belong to spiritual Israel. And that's where we stand. And so we need to look out for what the lesson is here. Now, by contrast, Lazarus symbolized all those people in spiritual poverty. So you have the Jews here. Well, who are those out in spiritual poverty? What did, what did the Jews call them? The Gentiles. The Gentiles with whom the Israelites were to share their heritage. Now, the words of Isaiah were well known to the Jews. They should be well known to you and I as well. Let's turn there, Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. And we're going to read verse 6. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. But unfortunately, brethren, the Jews had not shared their spiritual wealth at all with the Gentiles. Instead, they considered the Gentiles to be none other than dogs. The dogs would have to be satisfied with the spiritual crumbs that would fall from their master's table. And yet you find Lazarus eager, laying at the gate, desiring to be fed with just the crumbs falling. There are people out in this world would only turn their hearts to the Lord if people like you and I would be prepared to maybe live the godly life. Now, this figure of speech Jesus used when he was talking or testing the faith of the Canaanite woman. And we'll read it in Matthew chapter 15, if you want to turn there. Matthew chapter 15, verse 26 and 27. And it reads like this. It is not meant to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Have you ever considered that maybe you're in this church because maybe a family member in the past was fed by crumbs that fell from the master's table. The rich Jews, brethren, had hoarded the truth. And in so doing, it corrupted themselves. That's what happens if you and I hoard the truth. It corrupts yourself. Moments before relating this parable, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for their conceited spiritual attitude. As we read Luke chapter 16 and verse 15, he says, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And so, brethren, what was the result of this conceited attitude that the Jews had had? Let us turn back to this parable. Luke chapter 16, and let us continue reading from verse 22.
And it says from 22... And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which should, would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us, that would come from thence. So the Jews, brethren, had enjoyed the good life while they are on earth, but they did nothing to bless or enrich their neighbours. And so nothing was, no more reward was due to them. Luke chapter 6 and verse 24 and 25 reads like this. Luke 6, 24 and 25, But woe unto you that are rich! For ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. And so let us remind ourselves, are you rich? Of course we're rich. We possess a knowledge of the true God, plus a knowledge of the plan of salvation that God has set in motion for all humanity. Of course we're rich. Now on the other hand, the poor in spirit symbolized by Lazarus would inherit the kingdom of heaven. The Gentiles who hungered and they thirsted after righteousness, they would be filled. The dogs or the sinners so despised by the self-righteous Pharisees, they would enter heaven before they would. Matthew 21, 31 reads, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Now this parable concludes with this rich man begging for his brethren to be warned against sharing the fate he finds himself in now. Asking Abraham to send Lazarus on this mission. He declares, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. But Abraham replies like this, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And so, brethren, what do we understand, or who is Moses and the prophets? Who's Moses and the prophets? What is Moses and the prophets? It says this, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Who or what is Moses and the prophets? I know you know. It is none other than Scripture. Thank you, brother. It is none other than Scripture. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for their disregard of Scripture foreseeing that even a supernatural event would not change their hearts. Would not change their hearts. It is Moses and the prophets, brethren. The miracle of raising the real-life Lazarus from the dead soon afterwards confirmed the very accuracy of Jesus' conclusion there. One did rise from the dead. <clears throat> One did rise from the dead just, and the brothers of the rich man rejected. They did not repent. In fact, you see that the Pharisees even plotted to kill Lazarus 
after his resurrection. Lazarus' life was a reminder to them of their own hypocrisy. Christ's object lessons reads like this from uh, page 265. The law and the prophets, that's Moses and the prophets, or scripture. The law and the prophets are God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. And let us remind ourselves, it doesn't matter, we remind ourselves on a daily basis. The foundation of what you and I believe is in the word of God. Nothing else. You see, even the spirit of prophecy is built upon the word of God. God seen fit, if we speak about the spirit of prophecy, God seen fit because of our lack of faith. We need this extra lesser light to help us along. But uh, we are told here that it is the agency for the salvation of man is none other than Scripture. Christ said, let them give heed to these evidences. If they do not listen to the voice of God in his word, the testimony of a witness raised from the dead would not be heeded. Those who heed Moses and the prophets or scripture will require no greater light than God has given. But if men reject the light and fail to appreciate the opportunities granted them, they would not hear if one from the dead should come to them with a message. They would not be convinced even if by these evidence, for those who reject the scripture or the law and the prophets so harden their hearts, they will reject all light. It continues to read in Christ's Object Lessons, the conversation between Abraham and the once rich man is figurative. The lesson to be gathered from it is that even oh, that every man is given sufficient light for the discharge of the duties required of him. Man's responsibilities are proportionate to his opportunities and privileges. That's worth repeating because we can say your responsibilities. And so man's responsibilities are proportionate to his opportunities and his privileges. So you and I need to take every opportunity to share the truth. That's why the greatest influence is not so much standing here and speaking it, but it must be lived in the life, lived out in our lives. We could see clearly in our Sabbath school lesson that the falling away of sin, the proclamation of the gospel message to all the world, the world is, is going to come and to fall into two classes. No more, no less. Clearly when the Sunday law comes out, there'll be one class here and one class there. What class are we going to fall into? Are we going to make our choice to participate in? God gives to everyone sufficient light and grace to do the work he has given him to do. If man fails to do that which a little light shows to be his duty, greater light would only reveal unfaithfulness. And that's what Romans 16.10 says. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Those who refuse to be enlightened by Moses and the prophets or scripture and ask for some wonderful miracle to be performed would not be convinced if God was to grant their wish. And so let us now have a look at a literal application. A literal application to these two characters in their afterlife. Some Christians believe, and they teach also, it's in this world that we live in, that those who are consigned to the fiery torments of hell will never stop burning throughout eternity. So as we look at a literal application, first of all, if all the saints were, to, were gathered into Abraham's bosom, is Abraham a saint, do you think? 
if Abraham is a saint, and I believe Abraham will be a saint, of course, then whose bosom would, does he lie in? There's a, with a literal application, there's a lot of things that don't make sense. Secondly, if this is to be taken literally, neither of these two leading characters spent long in the grave. Both being taken away quickly to their respective rewards. Their bodies obviously went along, for we find the rich man lifting up his eyes, desiring to have his tongue cooled by a drop of water from Lazarus' finger while he was resting in Abraham's bosom. 